Hello, and welcome to another episode of Full Court Finance here at Zach's. I'm your host, Ben Rains. And today we're talking about some of the best sportswear stocks to consider buying right now. But before we get into that, I want to say remember if you have any questions or episode suggestions, please feel free to shoot us an email over at podcast at Zach's. Dot com. So today we're going to start off by talking about Foot Locker, uh, and they're due to report their fourth quarter and full year financial results on this upcoming Friday, March 1st, which is really crazy to say it's already March 1st this Friday. Uh, but before we get into what to expect from Foot Locker and why it's a Zach's rank number two buy, it helps to understand a little bit of what the stock's done over the last uh a little bit of time just to get you in a frame of mind of how the company is performing and what the perceptions are of the stock. Uh, uh, as most of you know, the retail market has been changing pretty quickly. So shares of Foot Locker are up uh, 615% over the last decade. So that tops the S&P 500, roughly 275%. So the stock's done well over the last decade. Uh, but then they ran into a rough patch starting in May of 2017. And the stock tanked from then until the fall, particularly November 2017. Uh, And then since then, so since uh, November 2017, shares of Foot Locker have soared 90%. You saw this with companies like Macy's and some other stocks, even like uh, Under Armour, where they plummeted and then it just reached a certain point where uh, it's a good enough deal for some investors. The stock's been on the rise ever since then. And then all this, this big This big turndown basically came as the likes of Nike and Adidas and all these companies are slowly trying to push out their their own direct consumer businesses in this Amazon age, which is something you'll hear from every company is they're trying to basically just their margins are better if they get it directly to you. And so slowly Foot Locker and places like Dick's Sporting Goods have had to bear some of the brunt of that uh, transition, even though companies like Nike are also still actively working with Foot Locker. But that's just a little bit of a picture of what was going on with uh, the stock over the last uh, five years or so. And then Foot Locker opened Tuesday, so opened this morning uh, near its 52-week high. It opened at... uh, $58.72 a share. So it doesn't give the stock that much room to run heading into earnings. So we'll see if if they have a blowout quarter. Maybe it can uh, pass by a new high, but we'll see what's going on from that. And then with that, now we'll we'll see what some of the projections are. So the company's quarterly revenues are projected to actually slip uh, just over 2.1% to roughly $2.16 billion. And this is based on our Zach's consensus estimates. Uh, but at the same time, it's interesting that their comparable store sales are expected to climb 4.6% based on our non-financial metrics. So you have their quarterly revenues overall expected to dip a little bit, but their comparable store sales expected to climb. Uh, and then this is during that vital holiday shopping period. So we'll see how investors react to this on Friday. Uh, but interestingly enough, that that good comps number is coming up against a really easy to compare fourth quarter of 2017 when their comparable store sales fell 3.7 percent so nothing particularly particularly great there but as i've said that the company was doing so bad that people are looking for uh maybe a little bit less of a threshold to be excited about Foot Locker. And then for the full year, they expect their comps to climb one, or we expect their comps to climb 1.35% after a 3.1% decline in 2017. And then at the bottom line, so Foot Locker's earnings actually appear to be pretty strong. So this is a good sign for investors. And this is what we really focus on here at Zach's because long term earnings growth is really correlated directly to stock positive stock price movement in the long run. So their adjusted fourth quarter earnings are expected to climb 8.7% to reach $1.37 per share. Uh, and then the full year earnings are expected to climb uh, 10%, which is a good sign there. And then their earnings estimate revisions have been very positive over the last 60, 30 days, and even the last seven days. So in the run-up to their earnings this Friday, you've had some analysts come in and be more positive on what they're expecting, not only for the current quarter and the current or the fourth quarter and the full year uh, this year, 
also we're looking ahead to next year there being more positive. And so that's what's helping uh, Foot Locker earn its Zach's rank number two by at the moment. And then on less of a note about earnings, but this is more of a, an investment they've made this month. Uh, Foot Locker announced on February 7th that they made a $100 million minority investment in GOAT Group, and that's just how it sounds, GOAT. Uh, and they own two marketplaces, GOAT and Fight Club, which are marketplaces, secondary markets for authentic sneakers. And this is similar to a company we've talked about on this podcast we talked about stadium goods late last year which was another secondary shoe marketplace that was acquired by the publicly traded high-end fashion e-commerce brand farfetch for 250 million dollars and this was in december and basically the deal is that Foot Locker sees these up-and-coming sites uh and storefronts such as the such as goat uh as the future and so this is from their press release uh the deal we'll see the companies and this is quote uh combined efforts across digital and physical retail platforms to create exclusive customer experiences that's very vague uh and then it goes on to say the power of Foot Locker's global footprint and group's digital capabilities will enable the two companies to provide an unmatched experience to elevate uh the customer experience and as I said, the basic premise is that Foot Locker is investing in this younger brand that has more of uh, a sense of what's going on on the digital side. They're, they're in the cool factor where Foot Locker, they have over 3,000 stores, but many of them are in malls, which as lots of listeners will know, malls in general are on the decline across America. So you'll see you'll see this Foot Locker partnership with Goat maybe maybe paying off in the long term and maybe they have kiosks within these places where they're selling exclusive stuff that maybe only Goat would have and that maybe uh, Foot Locker uh, in the near term can even benefit from an increased presence on Goat's digital platforms and uh, stuff like that. And also speaks to the greater overall market of how this these high-end sneakers have become kind of fashion at this point. And you can think of GOAT as basically the high-end eBay for sneakers and all these websites like that. And uh, as we've talked about on the show before as well, that Nike and Adidas are collaborating with movers and shakers in the hip-hop industry and the fashion world and that that sneakers and sportswear have become mainstream and this is something that you can see Foot Locker is invested in. And within the last 13 months, Foot Locker's also made some other investments. Uh, they invested in a children's focused lifestyle brand, uh, a woman's luxury activewear brand, and then another footwear uh, design academy as well. So they're, they're trying to expand at a time when the market is shifting. Uh, but we're going to talk about another company at this point that is helping fuel the industry that Foot Locker is, and that is Nike, uh, because as we mentioned, Foot Locker works, like their business is selling Nike shoes, and Nike has maintained their relationship with Foot Locker. It's one of the few big retail wholesalers that Nike has said we want to still be a part of this business going forward, so we're going to transition onto Nike uh, and that is also currently a Zach's rank number two by stock at the moment. And the sportswear giant is coming off a strong fiscal second quarter, which it reported near the end of December, 2018. Uh, it saw its revenues jump 10% and it saw its, uh, which topped our estimates and then which topped our estimates by pretty, pretty good margin. And then it saw it adjust its adjusted earnings climb 13%, which also blew past our estimates. And then more importantly, Nike's North American revenues, once again, surged 9%. Uh, and this is now continued growth in its most important market, its largest market after uh, almost a year's worth of decline, which stands in contrast to a company we just spoke about uh, a few weeks ago, and that is Under Armour, and they've suffered a continued North American decline, which is obviously not good long-term for their business. We should note that 
that strong quarter they had last year was going up against a pretty disappointing quarter in fiscal 2018. So easily uh, a good comparison there. But Nike's really regaining its strength in North America. And a lot of this is coming from its successful digital push. Uh, and the company's introduced multiple e-commerce focused apps. And they're, I think, in my opinion, they're kind of standing above their closest competitors, especially Under Armour, but even Nike, uh, their presence across social media is insanely bigger. And they've also been able to expand uh, in that athleisure business, which is what Foot Locker is kind of getting at with this GOAT partnership, how sportswear has become kind of high-end fashion or not even necessarily high-end, but just acceptable wear on a daily basis and not just to the gym. And that's something that Nike is going to really be able to continue to build on uh, probably for the foreseeable future as challengers like Lululemon and some of the Gap's uh, athleisure-focused brands like Athleta are doing well uh, on their own. And then Nike obviously also has that sports sports, sports presence in terms of they're a global leader in basketball and soccer, and they sponsor the NFL. They sponsor Major League Baseball now, which they took over uh, from Under Armour. So they, they really have a lot going on. And then in terms of actual digital revenues, their revenues surged 41%, with mobile now accounting for well over 50% of its digital commerce revenue, which, I mean, I follow this company pretty closely. That Sometimes that number shocks me. I don't really shop on my phone. You don't realize that now 50% of their their digital commerce is coming from people literally just buying Nikes and sweatshirts just from their phone. So this is long term when you hear about someone a company's presence on social media or all these things. People are buying lots of things just from their phone, maybe scrolling on the train, walking down the street, just sitting on their couch. So mobile in apps uh, for all of these retailers are really going to be hugely important going forward. And then you had Nike's CFO uh, on their earnings call last quarter say that he expects their digital division to comprise 30% of their total business by 2023 compared to roughly 15% at the moment. So he's expecting digital to double uh, within the next four years or so. So it's really interesting to watch there. And then they also continue to grow in greater China. The second quarter marked their 18th consecutive quarter of double-digit growth uh, in terms of revenue in China, which is hugely important going forward uh, for most retailers and businesses since China is the world's second largest economy. Now, I want to quickly look ahead. Uh, as I mentioned at the top, Nike has done this direct-to-consumer push. They're slowly phasing out some of their wholesale business, but they have uh, committed to working with Foot Locker specifically, Nordstrom's, and then some elevated experiences. This is from their words, not mine, uh, at places such as Dick's Sporting Goods. So they're not completely casting aside wholesale, but they're just being more... uh, I don't. What's the word? They're they're being more specific in who they're working with. They're not just selling it to every wholesaler out there. Uh, and now I want to quickly get into why Nike is currently a Zach's rank number two buy at the moment. And this mostly to do with their longer term earnings estimates. So for their current year, their earnings are expected to grow eight point seven percent. And then for the upcoming uh, fiscal year. Their earnings are supposed to grow uh, almost 18%. So some good long-term growth on the bottom line for such a big company. And then in terms of their revenue, their revenue for the current year is expected to grow about 7.5% and then 8% the year after that. So 8% on top of that to get to $42.25 billion. So that's a reference for just how big Nike is. And that's really steady growth for a company of its size, uh, especially compared to some of its competitors. And then Nike does, Nike stock does rest near its 52 week and all time high of 86, just over $86 a share, uh, which is not necessarily a bad thing. Some investors think that buying a stock at its all time high is a bad thing, but if you owned it before, you'd want it to be at its all time high. So often 
people buy stocks at their all time high and just kind of ride that wave of positivity. So don't be don't be afraid to invest in uh, companies at their all time high or near their all time high. Uh, and Nike is expected to report its fiscal third quarter earnings on March 21st, and they're also a dividend payer that boasts a beta of 0.7, which means they their their stock is less volatile than the market on average. So long term, Nike seems like it's a, a solid stock, and it's currently a Zach's rank number two buy. And then I'm gonna close with another company that we've talked about on this show before, uh, and that is Canada Goose. It is currently a Zach's rank number one buy. It has been for a little bit now. They uh, have had an interesting last couple of weeks. They reported their quarterly earnings, their adjusted uh, quarterly earnings for the their fiscal third quarter of 2019 on Valentine's Day, and they saw their shares plummet 13% that day, around 13%, despite posting better than projected quarterly financial results. So some people might say the downturn was caused by that around that same time that... Uh, the Commerce Department said that retail sales fell at a seasonably adjusted rate of 1.2% in December, which was uh, the largest drop since 2009. So that kind of shocked uh, investors in thinking the retail space was just going to have a lot worse holiday quarter than some would have expected. So that that could have had something to do with why Canada Goose stock plummeted, even though the quarter itself was pretty good. So I want to quickly go over how they actually performed in the quarter and then kind of look ahead on what to expect next from the company. So Canada Goose, uh, their adjusted earnings surged nearly 60% and it crushed our Zach's consensus estimate. They posted 73 cents a share and our estimate was for 58 cents per share. So a really good bottom line beat. Uh, and then on top of that, their revenue surged 45% to $302 million, which also blew by our estimate of $260 million. And this is in U.S. dollars. They're reporting uh, in Canadian dollars. Uh, and then more specifically, the Toronto-based company saw its direct consumer revenues climb 80% uh, in their vital holiday slash winter quarter, uh, which... Obviously, if you're selling parkas for $1,500, the winter is probably a time a lot of people are buying them. But then maybe uh, in the summer as well when you're gearing up for that next season. Uh, and then also their wholesale revenues climbed 22%. So they're not, as I said about Nike, they're not abandoning their wholesale business at all. Uh, and then in terms of the stock price, which is fairly important uh, at the time because it's now at a little bit of a discount to where it has been. Canada Goose's stock price, as I mentioned, plummeted uh, after it reported its earnings. Uh, it currently rests roughly 23% below its 52-week high at around $55 per share, which sets up, a, a, I guess, a solid buying opportunity for those who are high on the Parka, the Parka company from our neighbors up north. Uh, and now I want to quickly look at the outlook. So this is the guidance that uh, company executives gave, Canada Goose executives expect annual revenue to grow in the mid to high 30s on a percentage basis in fiscal 2019. Uh, this is up from at least 30% projection before, so they're now expecting high 30s, whereas before they were saying at least 30. So an improvement there, and then they're, they upped the earnings outlook from at least 40 to the mid to high 40s as well. So they're, they're more positive than they were when their previous quarter started. Uh, they're also expecting to see more growth in China as they roll out more physical retail locations. Uh, at the moment, they have 11 flagship stores. They have a store in New York City, Beijing, Hong Kong, London, Tokyo, and the other huge metropolitan hubs. And then you could also find their jackets uh which i said the highest price ones cost roughly 1500 bucks with it starting at around 800 dollars uh you can also find them at high-end department stores nordstrom specifically you can find them on amazon as well uh so they're growing and they're planning to open more 
physical retail stores themselves uh, this year as well. So now I want to quickly look at some of our estimates for what to expect. So for the current quarter, our estimates are calling for their revenues to grow roughly 20%, so a little bit of a slowdown, but this is also one of their slower quarters. And then so for the full year, we're expecting their revenues to grow thir just over 34%, so some solid growth there. And then for their current year earnings, we're expecting their revenues to, or their earnings to grow over 45%. So some strong bottom line growth and some strong top line growth. Uh, and then we've also seen some positive long-term earnings estimate revisions, which helps uh, Canada Goose sport its Zach's rank number one strong buy at the moment. And that does it for another episode of Full Court Finance. Until next time, I'm your host, Ben Rains. And remember, if you have any questions, please feel free to shoot us an email over at podcast at zax.com.